Good morning, class. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I wish we could all be together, um, but we're, uh, we're distancing and they say that's a good thing. I'm, I'll let you know after a couple of months. I, I miss seeing your faces. I miss the fellowship, the time of fellowship together, the laughter, uh, the insights, the wisdom that you all impart to me and, and uh, to each other. And uh, so I look forward to that day when we can be back together. Um, before we get started, as all of you know, um, I always have to pray and I always have to ask the Lord's help uh, because the reality is, is that I'm dependent upon him for everything. Um, and you all have heard me said it, say it before that I can't make my heart to beat. I can't make my mind to think. And I certainly cannot bring the word of the Lord and scripture study and Bible study uh, without the help of his Holy Spirit. So. If you'll just pause with me right now and let's ask for the Lord's help. And Father, we just come to you today and we come in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't come in our own righteousness because we have none. It's like a filthy rag. But we come in the name of the one who gave his life for us, the son of the living God. And we plead with you today, Lord. We cry out unto you and we say, help us, O God. Teach us what it is that you would have us to know about your Holy Spirit. Teach us, O Lord, what it is you would have us to know about ourselves. And I pray, dear God, that you would open the windows of heaven and you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Even now, Lord Jesus, pour out your Holy Spirit. Open the eyes of our heart. Teach us, lead us, guide us, help us. Bless us in ways that we can't do for ourselves. And Father, I pray most importantly that Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, will receive all the glory and honor and praise. It's in his name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at the post-ascension, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the early church. And this is the topic that uh, our fearless leader, Wagdi Waba, gave us uh, or gave me uh, several months ago now. And little did I know that we were going to be bringing this discussion and this topic uh, in front of a camera and, and instead of in front of you. But as is usual for me, when I start looking at scripture and I start looking at a verse, Rather than being sophisticated like so many Christian writers are and being able to just give you one verse or a portion of one verse, I usually get thrilled about what's before it and what's after it. And I probably print or read too, way too much scripture, but I don't know that you can really uh, read too much scripture. So today we're going to begin. If you'll look in your Bibles, if you'll turn to Acts chapter one, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter one, but we're also going to be looking at Acts chapter two, a little bit into that and to see what happened at the day of Pentecost and what happened after that. One of the things that I want us to understand is that the Bible age that we're living in right now is the same Bible age that the apostles and the disciples and the early church was in. And we mentioned this before when we did our study on Acts chapter two and verse 42 and in particular. And what do I mean by that? Well, essentially we're living at that time that Jesus has been crucified. He has been buried. He has risen from the dead. And now he has ascended into heaven and he sent his Holy Spirit. But he has not come again as he promised he would come again. And as we'll read in a little bit, the two angels told the disciples when they looked up to heaven that he's going to come in the same manner that he just left. So we're living in that same Bible age. But one of the questions I want to ask us today and I want us to look at is what was it that happened after Jesus ascended into heaven that caused the apostles and the disciples to be so completely transformed? What caused them to be devoted to the reading and the hearing of the word of God, to have fellowship in one accord, to partake regularly of Holy Communion and to pray like never before? What supernatural force led them to set their minds, set their hearts, set their affections on Christ above all other things of this earth? What gave them the boldness, 
the boldness to proclaim the gospel in the face of persecution, threats, and as we know from many of the apostles, even death later on in their lives. So we are in that Bible age that they were, but yet, you know what? There is something different. There's a power, there's a unity, there's a strength, there's an understanding, there's a knowledge, there's a boldness that the early church had that perhaps we're lacking today. And I hope that as we get through this lesson, as we read the scripture, that we would begin to see what it is about ourselves that we need to change, that we need to set aside those weights and that sins that we're reminded of from Hebrews. What is it that we need to lay aside in order that we can have that same kind of experience that they did? So we begin in Acts chapter one and we read verses one through 14 and follow along with me in your Bibles, if you would. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now we know that Luke is the author of the book of Acts and we know that he is the author of the gospel of Luke. So when he talks about having dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until he ascended into heaven, he's talking about the book of Luke. And it says in verse three, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And this is something that we have to remember that the resurrection is so critical, so essential to our belief as Christians. It's so pivotal. It's what distinguishes us among all other faiths and all other religions. But it wasn't just that he rose from the grave and he appeared to a couple of people. It says at one point that he appeared to 500. We know he appeared to the apostles and to the, and to the, the disciples. And it says here that Luke records by many proofs, Jesus Christ is alive. He arose from the grave. He conquered death. He said, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? He conquered it once and for all. And that's the assurance that we have. Let's read on in verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized, John the Baptist, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time re restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you, me, all of us will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We look forward to his return, don't we? Then they returned to Jerusalem as Jesus had commanded them to do from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and James and uh, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. Now get this, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And we know from the scripture later on that there was about 120 gathered in that room. When the day of Pentecost arrived, and this is, I'm reading now from Acts chapter two, verses one through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues of fire, uh, divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There was 120 there. 120 were all filled with the Holy Spirit. To those people who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be baptized. All of them will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and, and Pamphylia and all the other names I can't pronounce, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Many of these men, most of them were uneducated fishermen. And they were speaking a language they had never studied to a group of people who were there for Passover and now for Pentecost from all over. And it says we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. In other words, these folks are drunk. But Peter said, wait a second. He lifted up his voice and addressed them. He said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day or about 9 a.m., but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now get this, please. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And then he finishes up by saying this, and it shall come to pass that everyone, everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then let's skip down to verse 36. Let all the house of Israel heretofore know that for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. We have to ask ourselves the question today, where is the supernatural power of God in our lives and in our churches? We have done a wonderful job at educating many of the Christians and the people who attend church into doctrine. There's books that are written, there's seminars, there's classes 
There's even adult Bible classes that we can learn about so much. But where is the supernatural power of God? Where are the wonders, the signs, the unity, the devotion to the word and the devotion to prayer and the witness in the church today as it was and as we just read in the early church? Has God changed or have we? Does our Christian walk today, does your walk today differ from those believers in the early church? If it does, how does it differ and why does it differ? And then what can we do to regain the anointing of the Holy Spirit that the apostles and disciples had as an early church. So my prayer for each of us today is that we will clearly see that we cannot live a godly life. We cannot understand and, and, and interpret God's word. We cannot pray as we truly ought to. We cannot serve God adequately and purposefully without the Holy Spirit. So please remember that the apostles, they were with Jesus for three years. Think about this. I spent three years in law school. And, and at that time when my mind was fresh and I was much smarter, I think I learned a lot. They heard all of his teaching. They saw his prayer life. They saw his devotion to the Father. They witnessed his miracles. From an academic standpoint, they were knowledgeable in all of the doctrines of the faith. But they lacked power. They lacked power. Every one of us here listening to this video, this audio today, every one of us can hear the word of God. We can give intellectual assent to theology and to these various doctrines. We can say that Pastor John preached a really good sermon or we were inspired by a wonderful Christian book. But unless we have the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts and in our minds, all of that would be to no avail. What does the scripture say? The Bible teaches us that they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. Our power, understanding, help, our leading, the fruit of the Holy Spirit only comes from the Holy Spirit. As we read the scriptures in this lesson today, I pray that you would open your heart and mind to what the Spirit of the Lord is showing you about yourself. Now let's look at the promise of the Father because he told them to go wait for the promise of the Father. Go back to Jerusalem and wait and see about the promise of the Father. But let's take a look at Luke 24, Luke 24, verses 44 through 53, because we see where Jesus, even before his arrest and persecution and death and ascension, where he said these words to his disciples, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled, and we know that it was fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city, in other words, stay in Jerusalem, until you are clothed, clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. We know that there were about 120 people who were waiting for the promise of the Father. But it didn't come until 10 days after Jesus's ascension into heaven. 
And we know that during this time that they appointed uh, Matthias to take Judas Iscariot's position as an apostle. We know that they prayed, but they also cast lots. But what else do you suppose they did during this 10 days? Well, we just read about it. They worshiped him. They returned with great joy. I imagine what, can you imagine having witnessed the death of Jesus and then seeing him in flesh and the resurrected body? Can you imagine? And we get a, we get a glimpse of this actually from Thomas who doubted. But when Thomas was shown the resurrected Christ, when he held his hands and saw those, the, the, the nail prints in his hands, what, he's, what did he say? My Lord and my God. It wasn't Jesus the prophet. It was Jesus the Lord and Jesus as God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? So we saw that they had great joy and they continued in the temple blessing God. We see in John chapter 16, verse 7, that Jesus said these words. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go, do not go away, the helper or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, then I will send him to you. So here we see even Jesus before his death saying, it is important. It is important and to your advantage that I go to the Father. Because when I go to the Father, I'm going to send you the third person of the Trinity and he will be a game changer. Let's look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, verse five, we read that uh, uh, how Jesus talked about the baptism of John being of water, but that those returning to the upper room would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now the disciples heard this spoken before by Jesus at the beginning of his earthly ministry, because you remember that at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he went to John the Baptist and he was actually baptized him. And let's read what happened here in, in Luke uh, chapter three, Luke chapter three, verses 15 through 17. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we see that when on the day of Pentecost, remember, that not only was there the rushing mighty wind, but there the, were the cloven tongues of fire that appeared on all people gathered in that room. So here we see John the Baptist talking about that he will baptize with you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And oh, how we as the church need to pray for that fresh wind and that fresh fire. But let's take a note of a special note of Luke chapter three in verses 21 and 22. Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, uh, with you I am well pleased. One of the things when we read this verse that comes to mind and should come to mind is that if the very son of God who came from God, who is God, if he needs to be baptized with the Holy Spirit as he begins his ministry, how much more do you and I need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit every moment of every day of our lives? We see that, but there's something else going on here that I want your imagination to take you to, a place standing on the shore, because it is at this moment that scripture records to us that the Trinity was seen and observed in one place. Because what does it say here? It says the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. So they were able, and if we were there, we would be able to witness the Holy Spirit 
coming upon and descending upon Jesus like a dove. And then there was a voice from heaven. We Now we know that God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and truth. So we can't see God. We certainly can't see God and live as the Bible teaches us. But here we, there's a voice that came from heaven and it was the voice of God, of Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, the great creator. And he said this to Jesus, you are my beloved son with, with whom I am well pleased. And then we saw Jesus. So think about that. In this one spot, we're told that all three persons of the Trinity appeared to all those who were being baptized and those who were witnessing the baptism. How amazing is that? Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2 now in verses 1 through 4. This gives us the details of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And as we have read and learned, Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem during Passover, which is a memorial celebration of God's redemption of the Hebrew slaves from bondage in Egypt. Fifty days after Passover was the Feast of Pentecost, which is a celebration of the grain harvest. Now, Jerusalem was filled with Jews from the Mediterranean region who gathered for these two feasts, Passover and the Feast of the Grain Harvest or Pentecost. Jewish tradition holds that Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai 50 days after the original Passover. Instead of giving the law, though, the gift of Pentecost in Jerusalem that day was the Holy Spirit. And boy, what a gargantuan difference that made and continues to make in the life of every believer. But before we move on to this story and the signs and wonders and miracles that were happening all around Jerusalem as a result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think it's important to and beneficial to consider three things. Who is the Holy Spirit? Where is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit today? And what are the works of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer? Now, I want to say two things to you. For those of you who have been walking with the Lord for some time and have studied the scriptures and studied the doctrines and studied these things, this may seem to be a little bit elementary and and uh, fundamental and, and uh, maybe, maybe basic. But I have to tell you, even though I thought that I knew about the Holy Spirit, preparing for this lesson has shown me that the Holy Spirit is a person that wants to have more control in my life than I let him have. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has come to help me and to guide me and to lead me into all truth. But as we're going to see in a little bit, I have the ability and I have the power when I walk in the flesh to quench that Holy Spirit, to grieve that Holy Spirit. So even though this may be basic teaching to some, I think it's of incredible value to review these things. The second thing I need to tell you is that for those of you who are much smarter than me in theology and scripture, um, the reality is, is that um, this is not going to be an exhaustive, uh, in-depth study of the Holy Spirit. There's volumes of books that are written about the Holy Spirit. We're not going to attempt to get into that, that deep a discussion today, but I would encourage you if you're prompted by the Holy Spirit to begin to research and to understand what's going on here. So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit has been present with the Father and the Son before time, from the very beginning of time. The Holy Spirit was there at creation of the world and the creation of man, because we see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and verse 26, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. And then verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us, 
make man in our image after our likeness. Let us, who is the us? Well, the us is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Trinity showed up at the baptism of Jesus. We just talked about that. But the Bible describes the Holy, the Holy Spirit as a person, not simply a mere force. Now, I, ha I had to laugh in preparation for this because when I was growing up, the King James Bible was the most uh, familiar and prominent Bible that they used in the churches. And rather than the term Holy Spirit, uh, the King James Bible will often say Holy Ghost. Well, when you're a young child, you're not really crazy about having anything to do with ghosts. I mean, that just is a little little too uh, spooky. So I'm delighted that the uh, new translations use the word Holy Spirit, uh, uh, but Holy Ghost is okay as well. The Holy Spirit, as we talked about, is a person. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, and we see that in Ephesians 4.30. The Holy Spirit has a will, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where, where the Lord and the Apostle Paul talks about the manifestations of the Spirit are given to all of us, but each of us have been given different gifts. You know, some are called to be pastors and teachers and evangelists. Some are given the gifts of administration or helps or healing or gift of tongues or interpretation. The, the, there are many different gifts, so the Holy Spirit has a will and decides who's going to get what gift, but they come from one spirit, from the same spirit. And then we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, that the Holy Spirit uses his mind to search the deep things of God. And the Holy Spirit has fellowship with believers. So the Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person the third person of the Trinity, just as the Father and the Son are persons. In addition, we hear just before Jesus was taken up into heaven, say to his disciples, he said these things, all authority in heaven, and this is from Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I had commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In this particular passage, we see Jesus mentioning all three persons of the Trinity. Jesus mentions the Father, he mentions the Son, and he mentions the Holy Spirit specifically. So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is in you if you have received Christ. And let's talk about that now, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I was fascinated because several weeks ago when Ron Wilbur uh, brought the lesson, he talked about um, one particular Sunday school class where at the end of the class, there was a guy there named Stephen who was there. He had not been to the class before and he had not been to the class afterwards. But when they came to the end of the class, Stephen spoke up and he said something to the effect, God lives in us. God is not simply with us or around us, but God lives in us. So let's take a look. We looked at who the Holy Spirit was. Let's take a look at what this really means for us as believers. And the moment we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the moment that we put our faith and our trust in him, the moment we ask him to forgive us of our sins and we repent and we turn from our wicked ways, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 and 14, teaches us that the Holy Spirit is the seal of salvation for all those who believe. Now listen to this. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it 
to the praise of his glory. So when you heard the gospel story, and when you put your faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and as Savior, when you had accepted him and received him into your life, at that moment, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit and who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let me tell you how significant that is, how important that is. Whatever a king would own, he would often put his seal on. Here we are sinful, wretched creatures. If we look, I believe it's the church of Laodicea who thought they were something and he said, you're wretched, poor and naked, you're nothing. Here we are lost, self-righteous, sinful people. And we put our faith and trust in God. And he did not only save us, but he put his seal on us. And when he put his seal on us, he was declaring before all of the heavens and all of the earth, this is my child. Hallowed be his name. Hallowed be his name. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is, the, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, within you, not outside of you, but within you, whom you have from God? And then 1 Corinthians 12, 13 declares this, for we were all, all of us again, all of us who have received Christ, baptized by one spirit, one Holy Spirit into one body, not Methodist, Presbyterians, Church of God, but one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And Romans 8 and 9 tells us that if a person does not possess the Holy Spirit, he or she does not belong to Christ. It says this, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Finally, we see in Colossians 1.27 that to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And what is the mystery? He tells us, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Sometimes we may not feel like much. Sometimes we may despair, particularly in these days, and feel a little depressed. We may feel powerless. We may feel that a circumstance or a situation has rendered us hopeless. We may feel that a family member or a loved one or a friend is beyond help, beyond redemption. I would remind you, and Jesus would remind you today, that you have Christ in you. You have Christ in you. So we get down on our knees and we cry out and we plead out the Father and the Spirit that is within us, as we'll see in a little bit, begins to groan and to make utterance that we don't understand. We have Christ living in us. Hallowed be his name. 1 John 4, 15 makes it abundantly clear that whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, in him, and he in God. Is there any, any better place to be? That God abides in us and we abide in him. Praise God. The believer in Christ has become the inner sanctum of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God is not only with you, we've seen that with Emmanuel, God with us, but he lives in you as Stephen said in Sunday school class that day. And do you know what that means? All things, all things have now become possible 
not because of your mind or intellect or your manipulative abilities or your, your craftiness or cunning, and certainly not because of your righteousness. It's because the God who said, nothing is impossible with me is now living in you. No scripture better illustrates this than the comfort, comforting words of Jesus when he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Oh, do we all need a helper. To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. And how do you know him? Because he dwells with you and will be in you. And that's John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. So we have seen and talked about this morning who the Holy Spirit is. We've talked about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that God is not only with us, but he is in us with the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit. But before we consider the work of the Holy Spirit, let's consider the commands of Scripture concerning the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. It's interesting to note that the Jerusalem, uh, that, that the Jews in Jerusalem, as you remember what we read, who were filled with the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost or on that morning, they thought they were drunk. And now the Apostle Paul admonishes us in Ephesians chapter 5 not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. And I've often wondered, what is there a connection there? Is it because being drunk makes you uninhibited or makes you bolder or makes you louder or what have you? This is why there's this comparison. But it doesn't matter because what we know is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus commands us, God commands us to not be drunk with wine, to not be drunk with the wine of this world, with the things of this world, to not be so influenced by other people, to not be overcome by the cares of the world, but to be filled, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in Galatians wrote these words, but I say, walk by the Spirit, or walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then we are told not to quench the Spirit. So we have seen that we are commanded to walk in the Spirit. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. We are commanded not to quench the Spirit, not to grieve the Holy Spirit. But there are some amazing things life-changing results that the work of the Holy Spirit does in the life of every believer. And I want to go through them, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but I'm going to share with you the verse. And the first one is the indwelling spirit comes to a soul dead in sin and creates new life. Titus 3, chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We weren't saved by our works. We were saved by the drawing of the Holy Spirit, by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We were saved by the blood of Jesus. Number two, the indwelling spirit confirms to the believer that he belongs to the Lord and is an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. He says in Romans 8, um, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 8, chapter 15 through 17, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit of what? That we are children of God. And if children, if I am a child of God, then I am his heir, an heir of God, which makes me a fellow heir with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
And right before that, in verse 14 of Romans 8, it says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. We are not paupers. We are not helpless. We are children of the King. And all that he has is our inheritance, not only now on earth, but in heaven for all eternity. Number three, the indwelling spirit installs a new believer as a member of Christ's universal church. This is the baptism of the spirit according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, one spirit, and we've read this already, we were all baptized in the one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Number four, this indwelling spirit gives spiritual gifts, God-given abilities for service to the believer for the purpose of edifying the church and serving the Lord effectively for his glory. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, all these, talking about the gifts, are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Number five, the indwelling spirit helps the believer understand and apply the scripture to his daily life. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, that we might have understanding of the things freely given to us by God. Number six, the indwelling spirit enriches the believer's prayer life and it intercedes for him in prayer. And we see in Romans 8, 26 and 27, likewise the spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches hearts, knows what the mind of the spirit, because, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit within us that is interceding for us, but we are told through Scripture that Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father where He is interceding on our behalf. We are overcomers. We are overcomers because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What's the word of our testimony? Is that when I was too weak to pray for myself or when I didn't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit and Jesus were pleading with the Father. We're pleading with the Father on my behalf. How great is that? Number seven, the indwelling Holy Spirit empowers the yielded believer to live for Christ and to do his will. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And he goes on after that, the Apostle Paul, to talk about what the desires of the flesh or the things of the flesh look like, and it's certainly worth the read. And number eight, the indwelling Spirit gives evidence of new life by producing the fruit of the Spirit in the believer's life. But the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, this familiar verse, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing some fruit, all fruit? I love the word that's, I think, in the King James Version where it says, uh, long-suffering instead of patience, long-suffering. Number nine, the indwelling spirit is grieved when a believer sins. Ephesians 4.30, and we've seen this already, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of the redemption. There's that seal again. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. When you accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live and dwell within you. Do not grieve that Holy Spirit because through that Holy Spirit, you have been saved and sealed for the day of redemption. Number 10, the indwelling spirit seals the believer unto the day of redemption so that the believer's arrival in the Lord's presence is guaranteed after this life. It's a guarantee. It's not a warranty that you get from a new car dealer. 
It's not a guarantee that you get from uh, men's warehouse from the guy who used to say, I guarantee it. This is a guarantee from God, the creator of all, the one who cannot lie, the one whose word will never fail or pass away. He says this in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We've read it before, but let's read it again. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Put your faith and confidence in that guarantee. All hell may be breaking loose now, but guess what? The Holy Spirit is our guarantee that there awaits for us an inheritance to the praise of the glory of God. Number 11, the indwelling spirit is our helper and not only testifies as to the truth, but reminds us of the truth. Oh, we live in a world where we need the truth. And one of the dangers is that we become so educated about the doctrine of God and about theology that sometimes we begin to twist things or we distort things or how many times have we interpreted scripture to fit my particular situation in life? You know, or we take it out of context or what have you. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to guide us and lead us into truth. It says in John 14, 26, these words, or excuse me, in John 14, 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you for how, how long? Forever. And I will ask the Father and he'll give you a helper to be with you forever, who is the spirit of truth. And in John 14, verse 26, it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he'll bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Number 12, the indwelling spirit testifies who Jesus is and enables and empowers you to bear witness. John 15, verses 26 and 27 say this, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit will bear witness about who Jesus is. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Spirit of truth will bear witness about Jesus. And then you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. We're going to see a little bit in just a few moments when Jesus asks Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter gave that beautiful answer. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the spirit of God. And we need the spirit of God to be inside of us telling us who Jesus is because Jesus told us in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Scripture teaches us that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver you out of them all. So for me to understand who Jesus is means I understand who the one is that is able to carry me out of this fire. I understand the someone who is greater than the something. So the Holy Spirit reminds us who Jesus is. I walk with God. And if God is for me, who dare stands against me? We see in number 13, the indwelling spirit also convicts us of sin. John 16, 8, and when he comes, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. There's a danger here, though. And I want you to listen very carefully. The danger in the church today is not that we sin. The danger is that we no longer call it sin. 
we call it, oh, a stu- uh, maybe a stubborn attitude or, oh, no, that's just the way they are. Or they're direct. The, you know, if a person speaks unkindly of somebody, they're just direct. God calls it sin. And we have to be very careful because all of us know what it is to be prompted by the Holy Spirit. If we're reading something we shouldn't be reading, if we're watching something that we shouldn't be watching, if we're doing something that we're beginning to sense is grieving the Holy Spirit of God, he nudges us. But the more you resist that nudge, the harder your heart becomes. And if you do it long enough, then you're no longer sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important that we pray as the psalmist prayed, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see and reveal to me if there's any wickedness in me. And then lead me in the way that is everlasting. There's not a person watching this video right now who has not sinned against God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Pray in earnest that your heart would not become hardened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And yes, the Holy Spirit may ask you to give up something you don't want to give up. I've been there. I know. There are things in our life that may be a TV show that we just love. We've loved for years. And the Holy Spirit says it's time to move on. It's time to starve that part of your life with that particular thing. And it's time to set your affections on Christ. Don't let your heart grow cold. In fact, it says in Hebrews, I believe, today if we will hear his word, Harden not your hearts. Today, if we will hear the word of the God, today, if we will hear the promptings and the leadings and the nudging of the Holy Spirit in our conscience. Finally, number 14, the indwelling spirit will glorify the Son of God by guiding you into all truth. John 16, verses 13 and 14 say this, when the spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And the Holy Spirit will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and he'll declare it to you. Three persons in the Trinity, but one God. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. Charles Stanley said this in a message I listened to, uh, and I believe the message was entitled, Walking in the Holy Spirit. He said, to walk in the Spirit is to live moment by moment in dependency upon Him, sensitive to His voice and in obedience to Him. To walk in the Spirit is to live moment by moment in dependency on him, sensitive to his voice, and we just talked about that, and in obedience to him. I think it was Warren Wearsby uh, who said something to the effect that faith is not simply believing in spite of evidence, but it's obeying in spite of consequence. That we have a heart that says, I will obey the Lord, no matter what. Let me talk for just very briefly, and this is where I'm gonna get in trouble with my theologian brothers and sisters who are much smarter than me on this. There is a distinction between baptism and and filling. And I believe, and I believe most commentators believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs at the moment that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the filling that occurs is something that the apostles and the early church experienced in their Christian walk. For example, if you look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31, 
it says this, and when they had prayed, and here they're talking about Peter and John, as you remember, they were threatened not to preach the gospel and they came back to the group and they said, hey, not only are we not gonna not preach the gospel, how can we not testify as the things that we've heard and seen, but we're gonna pray for boldness. So the Bible says this, and when they had prayed, this is Acts 4, 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God and boldness. Now, does that mean that these same apostles and disciples somehow when they were filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that Holy Spirit left them and went some, somewhere else and they had to get rebaptized. I don't think that's what scripture teaches. I don't think that's what it teaches at all. These were men who were baptized in the Holy Ghost and as a result of that baptism and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, they preached the gospel. They devoted themselves to prayer and to, and to, and to fasting and to unity and fellowship and all these other things. But what happens is we encounter situations from time to time where quite frankly, we need a filling of the Holy Spirit whether it's teaching Sunday school or as Pastor John's going to do in a little bit and be preaching the word of God on bringing our Sunday message or Pastor Philip, whatever it is, or uh, whatever it is that we have going on, we need a filling of the Holy Spirit. So we see here that they prayed. They prayed. These people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwelt within them, they prayed and the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And because of this filling, they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It's an ongoing process. It's a manifestation and its manifestation is often seen in our dependence upon God, obedience to his word and the spirit's promptings. Romans eight, nine, as we saw above, tells us that if a person does not possess the Holy Spirit, he or she does not belong to Christ. So we, we, we know from that, that that these men and these apostles gathered in Acts chapter four, that if they didn't possess the Holy Spirit, then they didn't belong to Christ, but we know they did belong to Christ. So they had the Holy Spirit dwelling within, within them, but they prayed for that unction, that anointing, that, that filling of the Holy Spirit, and that's what the Lord did. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14 teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a seal of salvation for all those who believe. And it says it's the seal forever. It's the seal forever. So if somehow we get emptied of the Holy Spirit and then we have to be refilled, then it's not the seal forever. You see, so there's a baptism and there's a filling. Both of these scriptures assure us that the Holy Spirit does in fact come to dwell within us at salvation. And the fact that we can grieve or quench the Holy Spirit should remind us of the necessity to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, he doesn't say, you know, you'll lose the Holy Spirit. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in us when we've accepted Christ. So there is the baptism and there's the filling, but the filling comes to those who are dependent upon God, who are walking in the Spirit, who are walking in obedience to his word, who are devoting themselves to prayer and to the reading of scripture, to fellowship, to holy communion, to these things of God, just like the early church was. Let's look quickly at the day of Pentecost and then we're gonna be finishing up. Acts 2 tells us the glorious, glorious story of the day of Pentecost. And as we have seen in the scripture above, the Holy Spirit would not come to take up permanent residence in the heart of every believer unless Jesus went away. He, he even said that, it's necessary that I go away. So what really happened that day? What happened at the day of Pentecost? Dr. Mort, Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his message entitled Significance of Pentecost, said that the, on the day of Pentecost, what happened that was so unique, so wonderful, a once and for all experience, is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was born and empowered. It was inauguration day. He said, believers were welded together as one body in Christ. All believers became one just as Jesus prayed they would in John chapter 17. 
Before the ascension of Christ, there were believers, there were disciples, there were apostles, but they weren't one. The church had not been born yet, but at the day of Pentecost is when the church came alive. The bride of Christ at Pentecost came into existence endued with power from on high. And we see all of a sudden the promise of our Lord in John 14, verses 12 through 14 has become a reality. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The early church, as we know from the book of Acts, performed signs and wonders and miracles. They healed the sick, they raised the dead, they caused the lame to walk, and they caused the blind to see, all in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit working within them and to the glory of God. This same power, this same Spirit, is available to all of us today. All we have to do is surrender and yield. Sometimes it's a little frightening to think about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit being unleashed. To be sitting in a room and all sudden, or suddenly as it says, there's a rushing mighty wind and there's cloven tongues of fire appearing on us. That might upset our very perfect and normal lives in middle America here. We need the Holy Spirit. We have to be dependent. We have to understand that we are dependent. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we are dependent upon God for everything. And he gave us the Holy Spirit. Now let's pray that that spirit will be unleashed in the heart of every believer at Church in the Gardens. We know from James chapter 5, verse 16, that there was power in the prayer of a righteous man or woman. In the King James, I says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. But I say to you today that when the church as one body begins to cry out, God will move in such a way that will make you fall to the ground with your face to the ground in humble reverence and awe and at the same time make you stand up and leap for joy and shout for glory. Jesus, as we saw before, asked Peter that question, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he says this, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And then what did he say after that? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Our closing reflection today is simply this. What does it look like? What does it look like? When believers, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit, and we studied this in January, but it looks like this, and it's found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 47. This is what the church of Jesus Christ should look like today. And let's not lose this sight. Verse 42 says this, and they devote it themselves. Devote it. Devotion. It became more important than anything else in this, in this world. More important than the gym, their car, their money, their bank, their finances. More important than their marriage, their family. More important than anything. Jesus became their priority, their portion. They were found they found him to be all sufficient. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, which is the reading of the word of God, the hearing of the word of God. 
the understanding of the Word of God as revealed to us, as we've seen, it's one of the work of the Holy Spirit's to interpret Scripture to us. They devoted themselves to fellowship, being together, and that's one of the things that I miss now. But being together, encouraging one another, edifying the body, not gossiping, not backbiting, not being snarky, not being sarcastic, but coming alongside a brother or sister. I sure do love you. How can I pray for you today? How can I pray for you today? How can I help you? How can I serve you today? They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread, and not only does this mean that they ate together, but we know from the commentaries that this means that they partook of Holy Communion. And I'm not going to get into that very deep, but you all know that my wife and I do Communion, Holy Communion, every Wednesday night and every Sunday night. Why is that? Because Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget that my body was broken for you. Don't forget that my blood was shed for you so that you could have this new covenant. And it's a really great covenant. It says that you will never die. You will never die. You will have eternal life with me. I long for that day when Jesus says to me what he said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. They devoted themselves to prayers. And I want to speak just very briefly on this. They devoted themselves to prayers. You cannot read about the saints of old and not understand that they spent hours upon hours upon hours every day on their face before the Lord. They did not say prayers, they prayed. And what the Lord is teaching me right now, and what, you, what I want you all to get a glimpse of, is we read throughout scripture, they cried unto the Lord. Those words, they cried unto the Lord. Psalm 107 talk, gives us four stories of people in distress. And it says they cried unto the Lord. They, they, we plead unto the Lord. We've got to have a heart that essentially says, when I go to prayer, whether it's praying over my food or whether it's going in the morning in my time of devotion, or whether it's, it's at the end of Sunday school, or whether it's in church, I'm coming as somebody who's destitute, who is absolutely, totally dependent, or as Jesus taught us in the Beatitudes, who is poor in spirit. That when I pray, I am praying because there is no answer. The government stimulus will not be my answer. The healing from the laboratory will not be my answer. The salvation of my son or my daughter is not going to be answered in the wind or by chance. But no, when they prayed, and we see this in Scripture, and read it in Acts when they prayed, there was a longing, there was a yearning, there was a straining as the deer pants for the water. So my soul longs after you. That's the praying that we need to do in our prayer closet, and that's the praying that we need to do as a church. So they devoted themselves these things, and it says in verse 33, what happened? And awe, <laughs> awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day by day by day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with a glad and generous heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The day of Pentecost changed it all for us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit changes it all for you. As we close, I want to, I'm reading, or actually I just finished reading a, a book. Uh, it's an old book. It was uh, actually published in um, 1997, 
called Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire for, by Jim Cimbala uh, at the um, at Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. And I um, would highly recommend it. But he updated it in 2018. At the end of the book, he has a beautiful prayer. And this, I want this to be our prayer for today. Um, so if you would bow your heads with me right now, uh, if you have your phone with you, put it on silent because I'm sure it'll ring during the prayer. Um, if you have your TV on, mute it. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Father, thank you for your mercy and the salvation you have given us in, in Christ Jesus. Please forgive us for all our sins and shortcomings. Draw us to you and begin a new work of grace in all of us. Make us the people you want us to be. Fill our churches, fill our church with your fresh wind and fresh fire. Break our pride. Soften our hearts and fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Oh God, do all this so that the name of Jesus will be exalted throughout the earth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you.